Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm just going to do a short intro to this before we get going. I just recently did a plant talk at the Greater Portland Aquarium Society. Instead of doing the entire talk, because it is kind of long, and it's relatively similar to what I did for my own club, the Greater Seattle Aquarium Society, I kind of chopped it out and did some highlights. So this isn't the entire presentation, but there's still a really good uh, set of information here, as well as all of the questions that were asked throughout the entirety of the presentation by the members of the Greater Portland Aquarium Society. Uh, unlike some formal presentations, I allowed questions to come in just as I was talking. And um, there's there was a lot of like really cool questions that gave some great information that I think you're really going to appreciate here. So, you know, put this on in the background while you're doing water changes or whatever. You don't necessarily need the visuals. It's a little bit, it's a little close to an hour long. So hopefully you learned something. Let me know in the comments. If you enjoy stuff like this, give us a like, give us a subscribe, all the usual beggar YouTube things. And with that being said, let's get into the highlights of my talk at the Greater Portland Aquarium Society. Let's talk about the real story of how I got here. Like I said, I came back to this hobby about five years ago, almost six now, back in 2016. I became a member of the Greater Seattle Aquarium Society in 2017 after hearing about it from enough shops and hearing that they had a picnic full of fish nerds and I wanted to go to a picnic full of fish nerds. So I joined my local club. Four days later, I made my first ever fish-oriented YouTube video. It's terrible. I encourage you to laugh at it heartily if you ever watch my channel. In October of 2017, I found out if I participate in the Horticulture Awards program, I can get free plants. I love free stuff. So, uh, as you can kind of see here, I didn't just start with one entry. I started with several. By January 2018, a a few short months later, I had completed our Master Aquatic Horticulturist program. Normally, and most people in the GSAS, it takes about six months to a year to do this. It's a little different than how your guys is, is organized. But don't worry, I got some tips for yours. I achieved Master 2 in April of the same year. Started a, pro, a set of videos on my channel called Plants for Profit because I firmly believe you can actually be more effective growing plants than breeding fish if you're trying to either A, pay for your hobby, or B, maybe even make a little scratch on the side. <laughs> Master 3, May 2018. If you're noticing a pattern, I'm a psycho. I grow plants very, very fast. And we're going to get into that in a minute. As of October 2021, four years later, I achieved Master 10. I have propagated and flowered over 300 species of aquatic plants, all of which have been done submerged. No immersed growing, period. Some flowering immersed, but there's tricks to that. And the rest, as they say, is history. So why am I here? We're gonna talk plants. Specifically, how to master aquatic horticulture from Hap Chump to have chan. This is my first ever fish tank when I came back to the hobby. I almost tried to aquascape it. It's a Fluval Flex 15. Every plant you see in this picture died. I killed all of them. Don't be afraid to fail. You will. I did a lot. A lot. But we can learn from those mistakes. If you have an attitude where failure is just an opportunity to learn, it's a Thomas Edison quote, always be curious. If somebody tells you the only way to grow this plant is under high CO2 and high light, don't be afraid to try things that are outside of the norm, that are different. Because often, most of the lessons of how to keep plants correctly come from the 80s and 90s. Very rarely is this up to date with modern technology, and a lot of the things that we can do in aquariums now that things like LED lights, solenoid-based CO2 systems, all that kind of stuff is around and easy to acquire. Tenacity. 
kind of goes with that don't be afraid to fail. Don't give up. I've killed Monte Carlo more times than I can count. That plant hates me. I still try it at least twice a year. At least. And I kill it every time. I start to get it looking nice. Then it melts on. Got all sorts of other plants that I've literally never had success with. Ludwigia tornado, if you've ever seen that plant, that is the bane of my existence. I have never been able to get that plant to live more than two months. And it drives me crazy to this day. But I will inevitably try it again. If you get in plants pretty regularly like I used to, good lesson. You only need one to survive. Just one, and from there, you can start propagating. Your club, specifically, your HAP program is all about pure propagation. So in theory, a singular surviving stem lets you propagate faster than five. Now, I'm sure there's a few small requirements, but if you really wanted to hack the system, you could. The only true failure is giving up. If we keep trying and don't be afraid to keep trying, even when we have some of our hardest struggles, like me with Monte Carlo, we never fail unless we finally give up and stop trying. That is why I have grown as many plants as I have. Because even though I have killed plants left and right, I am not afraid to just keep trying. Understand your water. Let me give you some examples. Two times a year at my home in the Seattle area, I almost always get an outbreak of hair algae. Spring, fall. Heavy rain periods in the Seattle area. Why? I noticed this like a year and a half into living in my home and being in new aquariums again. I would, without fail, get these massive hair algae outbreaks. I've changed nothing. All of my lights are on timers. My fertilization is exactly the same. I'm not feeding my fish anymore. Why the am I getting a bunch of algae out of nowhere? It's because my water company runs a flush on their system two times a year. So two times a year, when they flush a bunch of stuff out because of some of the small buffering chemicals they use, because we have glacier water, there's nothing in it. It puts a bunch of extra nutrients in my tank that I wasn't accounting for. And all those extra nutrients were just enough of an imbalance for algae to go, I'll have some of that, and grow. Understanding our pH, our hardness, all these kind of things that come out of our tap, whether you're on a well, whether you're on city water, whatever it may be, and some of those like weird nuances like, does your city water company flush the pipes a couple of times a year and you're gonna get some random stuff you're not used to? This can help you a ton in understanding what you need to do. Do you naturally have nitrate in your water? Then you don't need to put a bunch of nitrogen into your tank. It's already there every time you water change. Do you have a lot of iron? Do you have a lot of calcium? Do you have zero potassium, which almost every water system out there, there's almost no potassium. These are things that can inform how we do our fertilization. Am I expecting you to know this ahead of time? No. It took me like three years to figure all that nonsense out. But it's more about learning as we encounter little things. Like yeah? Something I just uh, inadvertently uh, uh, noticed recently was I do small dosing of, uh, of uh, muriatic acid into my tap water just to acidify it a little bit. Okay. Uh, uh, I recently bought a better uh, TDS meter and was surprised to find that if there isn't enough carbonate hardness in my water to counteract the acid, that it ends up feeding the dissolved solids. So the dissolved, the, the TDS will go up. Spike up. Unless there's some carbonate hardness, and then the muriatic acid and the, and the carbonate hardness kind of neutralize each other, and the TDS goes down. Yeah, it's, so this is, this is where you get to play like mini chemist, for any of you who like really enjoyed chemistry in high school. Uh, there's all sorts of crazy stuff you can learn about your water that doesn't even seem to make sense until you start really digging in deep, right? Because you'll think, oh, I'm going to acidify my water. Why is my TDS going up? Why is my water getting harder? 
Yeah. So short of taking your water into a lab to be tested, mm -hmm. how do you find mm -hmm. out what the cal calcium and magnesium levels are in your water? It's just a, a GH test. You can do simple GH tests out of uh, your like API kits and stuff like that. They usually sell it on the side. They don't include it in like the standard freshwater master kit, but it is typically in the reef kits, which will help you. There's a lot of stuff in the reef kit that's actually super helpful in freshwater. You'd be surprised. Now there are, if you want to get real fancy, there are uh, photo spectrometers out there that you can get out of Poland that will let you test your water way more effectively and have enough reagents that come with them that will last you for years on end. But now you're shipping in like a $400 device from Poland and that takes a, a special form of crazy to do that. Uh, but like, have you yeah. noticed that, so the, I mean, the problem for a lot of us is that without that, without that blue light, our, our fish look like shit, right? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. And, and so, you know, the, 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 the 6,500 Kelvin daylight makes our fish all look like they've got a coating of mustard on the outside. Yeah. So, <laughs> so are there some of the spectrums, like, like for example, the, the saltwater guys like to have a lot of that 420 nanometer wavelength mm -hmm. blue, actinic blue radiation yeah. as a part of their, 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 you know, light makeup. And also, um, like ninety percent of their fish are algae eaters. Right, do, but do, are there are there some color spectrums in, in the blue range that are better than others as far as not growing as much algae but sure. still supporting sure. the color of the fish? So, um, when you get some of the cool whites where they're more like about seven thousand Kelvin, seventy five hundred Kelvin, that's going to help you because it has slightly more blue, but not so much of the actinic spectrum. Because once you get actinic, is typically anything that's ten thousand Kelvin or higher, which for reference, Kelvin is how the human eye perceives light. That's the easiest way to put it into your brain to understand what Kelvin means. Plants don't care about the Kelvin rating on a light. They don't. We care. Our, our simple human eyeballs can only perceive light in certain ways, and Kelvin is basically how we designed a spectrum to measure lights on how we perceive them. So when you hear Kelvin, just understand all that matters is how we see it. You see lights that are more yellow, they're lower. That really like orange light, which is called tungsten light, photographers love it. That's like 3,000 Kelvin. 10,000 Kelvin, you start getting very blue light. Doesn't matter to plants, only matters to the human eye. Um, so typically what I would say is, if you really care about blue, you can push your blue up a little bit higher, but just understand if you get your phosphates especially out of whack, like if you heavily feed your fish like I do, uh, because I want to make sure that my fish are fat and happy, happy kind of like myself, you're, you're going to get algae outbreaks just naturally. But you can also fight them off naturally. It just depends on your level of patience. If algae doesn't bother you all that much, I wouldn't worry about it. Pump your blue light up. If you're like the ADA aquascaper and you want that immaculate tank, get pure white light. But if you get the really, 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 really good stuff, and we're, at this point we're talking like your UNS Titan kind of lights that are god-awfully expensive, or your Chihiros Vivid 2s, those kind of things, that super good white light is like pure sunlight, and it will make every color on your fish pop. But you pay for it. It costs you a ton. Those are lights that are like three and four hundred dollars a piece. I like tech gadgets, but man, I struggle to pay that much money for a light. Lots of plants love shade. They don't like super intense direct light. Anything that has a big broad leaf generally survives better at medium or less light. Very, very fine leaf, high light. Easiest rule. Big wide leaf, less intensity. Very, very tiny fine leaf, more intensity. That's how you get success with those plants. Some plants do best with really long photo periods. This is usually your low demand plants. Swords, java ferns, crypts. You can give them 13 hours of light a day if it's low light. And they'll do great. 
but you give them 13 hours of really high light, and you'll have algae everywhere. Kind of goes back to that first lesson of understand the demands of your plants. This takes time to learn, trust me. But basically put, if it's an easy plant, it doesn't need a lot of light, and it typically likes light for a longer period of time, with the exception being almost all stems. Almost all stems actually like mm, six to eight hours of light. There's a lot of marketing about the quality of red light. Do you find that accurate? Uh, so there's there are some great studies out there from um, what Michigan State University has this amazing horticulture program, uh, and they've done all sorts of studies about red versus blue versus green light on terrestrial plants. It still applies somewhat to aquatic plants. Basically put, outside of pure white light, red light is the best light for plants because they can utilize the most of it. But it will grow your plants taller and leggier. So if you're trying to get really compact growth, you probably don't want a ton of red light. Really the only time that red light super matters is flowering and fruiting in plants. You could have no red light whatsoever, you'll do just fine. As long as you have good white light. A good white light is all you actually need. Everything else is kind of just there for show. It makes it look pretty. Makes it feel better. Makes it seem nicer. So that we, we silly, silly humans will spend more money on it. I know, because I buy into it all the time. You have a couple types of substrate. Active, inert. Inert is sand, gravel. These are things that don't affect your water chemistry. Active is something that will affect your water chemistry. Most commonly, in this case, we're talking about aqua soils. Dirt is in its own special category. I never personally suggest dirted tanks to anyone. The only reason why is there are a lot of potential pitfalls. You can certainly do dirt well, and if you are gonna do it, my suggestion would be no more than half an inch of dirt in your tank, and at least two and a half inches of sand or very fine gravel as a cap. Because if that dirt gets up into the water column where your fish are, game over. It is an absolute nightmare. You will get all sorts of ammonia, all sorts of pain, and your water looks ugly. This is why I don't suggest dirt. I have done it horribly, horribly wrong in the past, and I'm scarred for life. But eventually, I'm sure the YouTube gods will make me do something. You have alternatives, clay cat litter, safety zorb, turfus. Each of these has their own kind of special niche. They're basically like DIY substrates where we can do a thing called charging it, which is basically, it's designed, all these things are designed to suck tons of stuff up. So they have no nutrients in them, which means they'll strip our water column like crazy. If you're in the Northwest, you already don't have anything in the water column, so you can create a very disastrous situation for your fish. You can, however, soak those things in a number of different compounds, whether it's just calcium, magnesium, whether it's just a big bucket of fertilizer, whatever it may be, and effectively charge them because they'll store all those nutrients and make them available for the plants in the long run. For people who really want to go hog wild and crazy, this can be a very fun route, but if you want it easy, aqua soil is your best friend because it has a very high cation exchange capacity. This is about the biggest rule of substrate cation exchange. All this means is how much nutrients out of the water the substrate will absorb. It's an ionic bonding process. Chemistry is fun, but I won't go that deep. And make available to the roots of the plants. Even the most heavily water column feeding stems for long-term success still need a good root system, which means they need something available to the roots of the plants in the substrate. This is why aqua soils tend to be the easiest way to do this stuff. Cost you a little bit of money? Yeah, that stuff's expensive. Have you looked at a bag of Amazonia lately? I love 40 gallon breeders, which means I need at least three bags of that stuff. It's like a $60 bag of soil. So I'm, at, I'm out almost 200 bucks just in soil. What's, what's become of those uh, fractured, those fractured clay uh, medias that, that used to be so popular? Uh, so you can still find a lot of them. 
The problem is most of them go under the same thing as your like clay cat litter, safety sorb, turfus, and then usually you need to charge them in water like ours. Now, if we were in the Midwest where there's like a million billion minerals in your water at all time, you could just throw them in there and wait. The water will do the work for you. But in our case, uh, typically what I would suggest if you do go those routes, use magnesium and calcium to charge them. Those are the two most important things for building roots in your plants. So if they're available there at the root system, plants will go hog wild on them, give you super robust root system, be super healthy, and then they can do the rest from the water column with just liquid fertilizer or however. So how much, how much difference does a good diffuser make? Because I know a lot of people really bubble the heck out of it, but, it, but if there's no friction sure, to the bubble, sure, sure. if there's nothing that's breaking it up and causing it to interact with the water around it, mm -hmm. it doesn't, there's, there isn't really a good exchange. Yeah, so diffusers do matter. Um, I tend to run one of two, either inline if I have a canister filter or what they call the atomic diffusers. They give you a super fine mist. You're still going to lose some amount of CO2 that's just not going to get absorbed by your water. Uh, also, one half myth, the more churn you have at the top of your water, people will always tell you you're going to off-gas all your CO2. It's bull. All of our natural environments where these plants grow, none of them have injected CO2 in their water systems. They get their CO2 through gaseous exchange at the water surface. There is more carbon in the atmosphere than you're ever going to put in your aquarium. The atmosphere right now currently is somewhere between 400 and 450 parts per million of CO2. I won't get into climate change talk, but that's a lot. That's why plants that are terrestrial grow amazing. That's why a lot of people who want to grow plants super fast do immersed growth. Way more carbon. If we get much above 30 parts per million in our aquarium, our fish start to suffer. Think about that. 400 to 450 up here, you and I are breathing, versus 20 to 30 in your aquarium is about the sweet spot. So we'll get into fertilization because this is pretty important. There's this lovely graphic that Aquarium Gardens, a company out in the UK, created, which is like the, the, the triangle of power, if you will, between light, your macronutrients, and your micronutrients. Very, very important balance. When this is in harmony, you will have almost no algae. You will have beautiful plants. You will have dense plants. And it looks stunning. But the second one of these three is out of whack. That's when algae can capitalize on you. This is a very careful game. And yet, not. You can tinker and play and mess with this stuff constantly as long as it's not so out of whack in one direction for a long period of time. You have room, you have flexibility, especially in bigger tanks. Now, in like a five gallon, probably see algae a lot faster than say a 40 gallon, but any time that we run with any issue in our plant health, it's about this balance. Remember that part, okay? This picture is your best friend. You can find this easily on Google by just looking up aquarium plant deficiency chart. This will show you what your leaves of your plants will look like when you have a deficiency in any of your macronutrients. Macronutrients, simple way to understand that. These are the stuff that our plants consume in the largest quantity need the most of. A majority of our fertilizers, for like all-in-ones, these are the, the big portions of them, right? Nitrogen, potassium, phosphate, calcium, magnesium. A little tiny bit of sulfur. Sulfur like plays a special game where it's like halfway. Macros are the bulk of our fertilizers, but not all of it. Now this, this is your second best friend. Same search, we'll find this. All the micronutrient deficiencies. I keep these handy all the time. Because even someone who's a plant psycho like me doesn't memorize this. Micronutrients are our trace elements. We need them in small, small, small amounts. But they all have these super important things that basically all tie back to photosynthesis. There's a lot of them. Some of them have funny names. 
Iron, that's simple. Chlorine, it's a typo. It's bad that I spot a typo in my own presentation right there. Copper, boron, molybdenum, cobalt, nickel, manganese. That's one of the funny ones. Some of these will look like macronutrient deficiencies when they happen. You can almost always dose extra micros and never cause yourself algae problems. So something like Flourish Trace, as much as I hate the Seachem Flourish line because it's too complicated. Um, Brightwell has Florin Multi, which is basically all your micros plus potassium. Potassium is the one thing that is basically never present in natural water. There's a million different of these, right? For every line of fertilizer, somebody has a micronutrient doser in it, except the aquarium co-op. <laughs> and as much as I've tried to get Corey to do it, he won't. <laughs> but you can almost always, the second you see some kind of problem with your plants, dose a little extra micros and never have to risk algae and fix 90% of your problems. You, you don't need complex fertilizer. You don't. You can do it simple and easy, and it will do just as well even with high demand plants. It's all about your personal preference. If you want to tinker for the guy who's adding muriatic acid to his water, maybe you want to go with estimated index. If you work an average of 60 hours a week and sometimes you even forget to fertilize your plants, you probably want to just do all in one and be lazy about it where you're just a bottle going, Okay, we're good. We're done. Hopefully I remember to do that next Wednesday. This is how your plants utilize all that fertilizer. Notice this part. Carbon. 80%. 80% of what plants care about is carbon. 20% compiles all the rest of that stuff. All the macros, the micros, all of it. This is why CO2 is steroids. Because the second you make more carbon available, it absorbs more of everything else. And plants can grow a lot faster and better. Not necessarily required, but that's why CO2 is really, really powerful. Only be as complex as you are willing to do the maintenance for. If you don't want to make seven bottles of solution for an estimated index and be dosing every single day in every tank, and you have 20 tanks or you have 100 million like Danny and Kenny do, uh, get an all-in-one. It'll take you five minutes. You can, however, take things that are simple, like an all-in-one, and adapt them. An example would be, let us say you had a 60-gallon tank. You're going to do six pumps of an all-in-one fertilizer a week. You could do one pump Monday through Saturday, it's the same thing, except now we're treating it like estimated index or what is also called lean fertilization, where there's a consistent low dose of fertilizer always in the water so that your plants always have something to feed off of. If you have the time, this is actually how I suggest doing it. It's way more effective at getting healthy plant growth and combating algae. Root saps have their place. I like to use them when I start a tank. I almost never use them after a tank has established itself. Even with heavy root growing plants, I still just use a liquid fertilizer. But that's because I use aquasoils because I'm lazy. If I haven't made this apparent, I'm lazy because I don't have a lot of time. CO2, low and slow. It's like barbecue. Makes your life a lot easier. Takes a little patience to get the results. You're not going to instantly have that super dense, amazing Dutch aquascape overnight. But you also don't have to trim it every week. Saves yourself time, still gives you the benefit. Always look at your plants. When you're feeding your fish, pay attention to your plants a little bit. If you see something's off, like the plant looks a little yellow, that plant has holes in it. Those leaves all of a sudden, instead of being big and flat, are curled up like this. Your plants will tell you everything. They'll tell you stuff faster than your fish will. 
So if you pay attention to your plants, you can actually, at a quick glance, see a problem, go consult those charts, and you will know what you need to do to fix the problem. And eventually, you memorize 90% of those things, and just by feeding your fish, you go, oh, that's good, that's good, that's good. Oh, Java Fern's low on potassium. Okay, yeah, that's good, that's good. It becomes easy peasy. It's muscle memory. It's just like anything we do. The more we practice it, the better we become at it. Some plants are special. They really love one thing. I keep going to Java Fern and potassium because it's the most common problem that people have because potassium is not present in water naturally. But it's a very potassium hungry plant. Crips, regardless of color, love iron. You want to get better, healthier crypts, or you want your crypts to propagate, make runners faster, give them some iron. Monte Carlo, the plant that hates me, it's a calcium hog. It loves has, having harder, more calcium-rich water, which is something that I don't keep, which is why I'm terrible at keeping Monte Carlo. I don't have enough calcium in my water pretty much ever. You'd think I'd learn, but I don't. Adapt your fertilizer to your water. If you're on a well somewhere and you have a bunch of nitrates in your water, you can just dose your micros plus a little potassium. And every time you do a water change, you're adding all the nitrates you ever need. Do you have really high levels of calcium and iron in your water? You don't need calcium and iron dosed in your fertilizer. This is where you can start getting into some of those EI dosing methods by getting individual compounds, save yourself a ton of money in the long run, but also balance your system, that nice little triangle, right? So that you don't deal with algae. It takes time to learn, but once you do, it's a very, very powerful and effective tool. Adapt your lights. Lots of Anubias, lots of Java Fern. Don't run those things at full blast. Dim them down. Only doing stems, don't run your lights for 13 hours a day at like 20% power. Run them for six hours a day at 100%, right? Do what the plants want. Last little lesson, balance is hard to find. It takes time, it takes patience, it takes lots of screwing up. But don't be afraid to tinker. We're only dosing our fertilizer twice a week, what happens if we spread it out to three times a week? My plants are growing too fast. How much can I dim my light down before I start seeing negative effects on the plants? Because I don't have enough time to trim every couple weeks, whatever that may be. There's lots of ways that we can play with stuff. So very, very healthy plants, have a tank that looks great, get ourselves horticulture award program points without being overbearing. Never be afraid to tinker. You're not going to hurt your fish, don't worry. They'll be fine. Unless you, like, dump the whole bottle of fertilizer in. Just don't do that. But little, little, little adjustments constantly, you will find the perfect balance for you because your water is different than my water. His water is different than his water. You could live three blocks away. Tiny differences in your water. I have a friend who lives quite literally three minutes from my house. We have compared light, fertilizer, and plant regimes in a tank. There is a distinct difference in our water because of the piping used in our house. His house was built in the 50s. Mine was built in the 80s. The piping that's in the house leaches just enough extra stuff into his water that he actually has to dial back certain things or change his fertilizer because it adds stuff to the water. Tiny, tiny things. That's why every fish tank is unique. We learn our water and we adapt to it. Man, success is easy at that point. You could even grow Monte Carlo, unlike <clears throat> me. Cheat the system. Remember that software engineer part where I break things for a living. I exploit things for a living. 
You can do this with your horticulture awards program. I did it to mine. Number one, cheat. Use CO2. It's expensive to start, but man, it makes stuff super easy. It's like having steroids. You baseball fans, remember the steroid area of baseball? Home runs are getting hit all over the place. Cheat. Two, hack. Design your system ahead of time. If you really want to go all out and grow plants specifically to hit your master of water horticulturists, I even looked at your program. I spent like a week just looking at your program, figuring out how I could break it. The answer is actually really easy, but uh, don't do that. It's not fun. You don't actually learn anything that way. But this goes back to that whole thing. If you're doing lots of like low demand plants, design the system that way. You don't need a crazy substrate if you're growing all epiphytes. You could have sand. You could have a bare bottom tank. They don't need to root feed into substrate. They get that from the water column. Are you doing all crypts? You don't need a liquid fertilizer. Put root tabs in and have a good substrate. It'll last you months. Design your system based on the plants you plan to use. Avoid. Don't get attached to your plants. If you want to do this fast, wheeling and dealing is your best friend. You are basically the new aquatic plant drug dealer on your block. <laughs> and boy, have you got something new for them every week. Go through your plants. I mean, if you really want to break your system, at one point when I was, I, I got three different levels of master inside of four months. Because I would just churn and burn through my plants about as fast as was humanly possible. I grew a ton of stems. I would, I would just rotate. I, I did like seven species of Rotala in half of a tank and a bunch of different species of Ludwigia in the other one. It's all stems. It was all water fertilization. I cranked all my lights up to maximum. I dialed my CO2 just up a little bit. I went from three bubbles to four. And every day I just sat there going, have that fertilizer. Suck it up. There you go. Grew like wildfire, like weeds in my yard. And then... Next meeting came up, auction at the end of my meeting. I cut all of those plants out. I bagged all of them up. I took them in. I sold all of them. And I bought all new plants with the profits. I went back to my tank and I ripped out everything I didn't absolutely have to need because I hadn't finished my propagations yet. And I replanted everything new. I did that for several months in 140 breeder. I used one tank to get three levels of master aquatic horticulturalist in my club. You could get master in your club inside of a year in one tank. If you avoid getting attached to those plants and treat them like a slash and burn farmer in Africa, just <laughs> rip through those bad boys as fast as you possibly can. We're going straight to harvest as fast as possible and then move on to the next plant. Don't get attached if you want to cheat the system. Four, extract. Look at all these wonderful people here for a plant talk. Use events, use meetings. This is how you lessen your costs by selling those wonderful aquatic drugs to your new friends that you just met today. But they're here to learn about plants, so clearly, they need what you have. Extract. Also, good network of people who all want to grow plants. Somebody's got something you don't have yet. Find it. Get it. Grow it. And then sell it to everybody else. It's the easiest way to walk through the system, especially if you're trying to grow a stupid number of plants really fast, without it costing you an arm and a leg and maybe your car payment. All right? <laughs> this is how you can save money. It's just... Don't be afraid to trade plants, sell plants, buy plants at your club events are way cheaper than if you buy them from any of the stores online. You can save yourself money, have a little fun, make a few friends at the same time. Finally, kind of mentioned it, trade. It's all sorts of horticulture award stuff right here on this table. I bet we could find something that you haven't grown. 
and you can talk to that person and find something they haven't grown. A trade. Now you're both benefiting, and it costs you nothing. More plants, faster, faster you go through the program. Cheat the system. All right, finally, the big one, proliferate. Now, that flowering part doesn't matter to your club. You're all about propagation. So we could basically ignore this part. But if you like growing pretty flowers on your plants, we'll cover. Stems, easiest way to propagate them is by cuttings. Fastest way to propagate them? Ah, let them grow all the way to the surface and drag across the surface. They will grow lots of tiny baby stems off the side. Now instead of getting one propagation, you can get 10. Now instead of having one extra plant, you can have 10 extra plants. That's two bags. You take that to an event. Now you've got more stuff to trade with your other drug addicted friends. It's great. <laughs> Some stems, like alternate theras, are probably the best case of this produce most of their child plants by side shoots. In alternate thera especially, fun, dirty trick. You get that plant up to yay tall, let's say. Say so that's the highest you want it to grow. Trim the very top of the plant off. It will grow no higher, and it will start actively producing side child stems. Now you've got lots of extra stems to propagate or sell. There are tricks with lots of stem plants that way. You can do the same thing with um, your Rotalas and your Ludwigians. Get it to a certain height, trim the very, very tip of, top of it off. They'll start growing child stems down the bottom of the stem like they were laying across the top of the water. It gets you a lot more plants way faster. Very, very easy that way. Rosette plants. Those are your crypts, anything that's got kind of a crown and a big root system, right? Those almost always propagate via runners, the exception being a majority of swords that will put out a big spathe that has its child plants on it, right? How do we make these propagate faster? Almost always your big runner style propagation rosette plants, medium to low light for a long period of time, the more you shade them, it stresses them ever so slightly. If you find the right balance, they will propagate like crazy because they're trying to keep themselves alive down the chain and find more light. So if you bring the light to just the right level of low where it doesn't kill it, stresses it just a touch, it will start producing way more runners trying to find light somewhere down the chain and use that one plant down here to feed that mother plant all the way over here. It's a dirty trick. But this is also where your less powerful lights become your best friend. Recently, I started playing with the Fluval Aquas guy. You see him in like every pet cone known to man. Most people think that they're not a great light. With Crips, they're like the best light because they don't have so much intensity that one crypt can just sit there and bush out and look amazing. It almost forces the crypt to create those runners to work in tandem to photosynthesize more. It's really, really effective at that particular point. Bulbs and seeds. This gets a little more complicated, but most of your bulb plants especially nymphaeas, right? So all your lilies and lotuses. Once they've established a one very, very healthy plant with a good root system, you can break that plant off of the bulb. And as long as that bulb stays sunk, so it has some density to it, it will eventually grow a new plant. When I first, uh, my second tank, big 125 gallon tank, I wanted to grow tiger lotus in it with a bunch of rainbows. It's a big display tank that now it's called my retirement tank because it's just old and not as pretty as it once was. I had a single red tiger lotus bulb 
I figured this stupid trick out on my own because I accidentally broke the plant off of the bulb. And I panicked. I panicked like crazy. But it's like, ah, it's got a root system. I'll just plant it and it should live, right? What do I do with the bulb? Well, it's heavy. Maybe it'll grow something new. Left it in there. That tank at one point had 30 nymphaeas in it. <clears throat> 10 of them from the same bulb just regrowing. And eventually, the other ones grew themselves new bulbs under the substrate. Bulb plants are really, really incredible when you learn how to leverage them. They just take patience and time to do that kind of stuff. It takes a lot longer than something like a stem or a rosette. But you can, instead of buying a whole field of lotuses, start with one and patiently grow new plants off of it if you want to. And when you get a big field of them, they look amazing. It's really incredible. Final thoughts. How to get paid. I know, I said no of acronyms. Patience. You will mess up. I've messed up a lot. Everyone messes up. But over time, you learn and it happens a lot less. Adjust. <laughs> do things based on your schedule and tank. If you don't have the time to do estimated index, don't try to do estimated index. Use it all at once. If you have all the time in the world, grow like 17 different species of plants in a single tank, have a really complex regime and a really crazy light, and just clean the algae off your glass like crazy. And you'll grow a ton of stuff really, really fast. It'll be amazing. Insight. Just watch your plants when you feed your fish. They will show you when things are going wrong. Address them immediately, and you'll do just fine. You'll learn a ton by doing that. Finally, do. Participate. Enjoy your local horticultural awards program. It's fantastic. You guys actually, I would say, have a slightly stricter program in the sense of what it takes to achieve your master rank than the Greater Seattle Aquarium Society. The only difference being that they'll just let us achieve a number of masters into infinitum uh, if we want to be a psycho like me and just keep doing it over and over and over again. Because deep down, all you want is free plants. Ah, yes, plenty of them. Uh, just for my own... Greedy purposes, I'm going to repeat your questions, but go ahead, Beck. We have an anubias that is completely covered in blue green algae. Okay. So we, and it's back and forth for a couple of years. We change the lights, we take it out, we dip it, we spray it, it doesn't ever get completely done. Okay. What do you suggest? Okay, so just for my own greedy YouTube purposes, anubias constantly. Over and over, we're fighting cyanobacteria, blue-green algae. Dipped it, tried all sorts of stuff. Let me ask you a first question. Are you using sand as a substrate? No, that one's rocks. Rocks, interesting. Because usually, with cyanobacteria especially, <laughs> it's because we have excess silicates in our water, which normally comes from if we have, like, play sand is the most common way that this happens. You can, in theory, test for silicates, to see if somehow you are getting extra silicates in your water, which is possible. But um, usually what I have found is when I'm dealing with any kind of blue-green algae, I'm usually feeding too much. And the way that I, I like to adjust my feeding, so most fish only need about 1% of their body weight per day in order to be healthy. This, there is exceptions, of course. But what I'll do is whatever I feed every day, I just change the feeding every other day because it automatically just halves the amount I'm feeding. Over time, that usually can fight off because the extra things that are coming from your food, a lot of like phosphorus, phosphates, things like that that also feed it. Silicates is the most common, but not always. This tends to make it so that the algae no longer has those things to fight off of. The other thing you could be doing, because cyanobacteria is a bacteria, not actually an algae, the erythromycin is your best friend. If you full dose your tank with your erythromycin for a couple of weeks, you're probably killing it. There's probably some of it that's deep, deep down in the gravel that will address the surface layer part, but it just keeps coming back. Where if we use a really good erythromycin dose, we can kill it completely and it doesn't come back. But 
if you start seeing it retreat or go away entirely at just the surface, I would still dose for at least another week or two to make sure you're killing it all the way down in the areas we don't see. Because once you've killed it all the way off, it doesn't come back. And it's really susceptible to erythromycin, where a lot of our uh, fish disease bacteria is, not all of them are, because it treats gram-positive bacteria. Hopefully that helps. If not, I have an email. You're welcome to email me. I'll keep working with you. Go ahead. Yeah. So, like I said, we have very soft water. What, mm -hmm. How do you like the uh, other shell? <laughs> okay. So uh, being lazy, you just drop it there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, again, for my own greedy purposes, we have very, very soft water in the Pacific Northwest. How do I like Wonder Shell? Uh, I regularly buy the small, the ones you get three tiny Wonder Shells in a pack. I buy them like 20 to 40 at a time. I very regularly use Wonder Shell. Uh, now, if you want a longer term, simpler solution, you can use something like crushed coral or like oyster shell or something like that. But honestly, I like Wonder Shell because it adds a few extra minerals that you don't naturally get. So it lets me kind of be lazier on a few other things. Um, it also depends on if you're doing full water changes versus top offs. If you're just doing top offs and you keep adding Wonder Shell, you're just going to drive that mineral count really high and it cause some potential other issues. But if you're doing full, if you're doing big like 50% water changes once a week, Wonder Shell is amazing. It's it's super super useful. It's not terribly expensive. It's it's a great easy huck in and do the work for you. Go ahead. Um, just a tip and trick. Uh, the Wonder Shells are great, but if you want to really go on the cheap, buy plaster carrots. So I got the little silicone mold. Do the plaster parrot, drop it in the tank. So it does the same thing as the Wonder Shells, and super, super, super safe. Again, for you people on YouTube, plaster of Paris, basically the exact same thing. Make a mold, way cheap. It's like ninety-five percent the same thing. There's some small secret sauce in the Wonder Shell that they never want to expose, but that's how they keep their business going. So, any other questions? Yeah, come back. What uh, liquid nutrients do you personally use, or what have you seen the best results with? Okay, so what liquid nutrients have I seen the best results with? This gets fun. I've tried a lot of stuff. Um, I will say that almost all of them are so closely formulated that the difference is negligible. It is more likely that we're doing something else when we see one thing be successful and another thing not, if it's a like full all-in-one. Now, Flourish is like a, an example of not being the same. It's all about understanding the the guaranteed analysis of those fertilizers, which not all of them advertise. I live in the Seattle area. I support Aquarium Co-op. I buy a lot of Easy Green. I go through buckets of that stuff. But if you have a really high fish load, so you naturally have a decent amount of phosphate and nitrogen already in your water from fish waste and your food, Brightwell's Floor and Multi is perfect. It's all your micros plus potassium. It's basically all you need, and everything else should supply itself, especially if you're buffering with our super soft water with like crushed coral or something to get your calcium and magnesium in the water. With the uh, current co-op one, because I use that one, are you also adding micros onto it, or are you just doing just that one? Okay, so uh, the extra clarification is, am I adding micros to Easy Green and All-in-One? Depends very heavily on the tank. So if I have tanks with tons of Java fern, where they're going to just eat through a ton of potassium, then I do dose extra micros. If I have something that's mostly crypts or stems, no. Or if it's um, like bulbitis, because bulbitis is one of those ones that just doesn't really absorb extra whatever, no. Uh, it's, it's a lot of eyeballing at this point, like I've done it long enough that I can look at a tank and go, oh, it is light on micros. Pull out my micros and just dose those. But for the most part, there's enough of everything in Thrive, Co-op, pick your, pick your all-in-one poison, that if you're dosing it regularly enough, especially if you try to do, dose a little bit every day, you almost never have to worry about that. Anything else? Can you run your red lights? Okay, so... Uh, sure, sure, sure. 
So the, the question is, uh, does timing of the red light matter at all? Whose car is being mean? <laughs> um, so you don't want to run it at night because your plants aren't really photosynthesizing. They're not going to take advantage of it. I have found, and maybe this is purely just circumstantial bias, but I have a, a setting on my fluval lights, which is where most of my big plant growing tanks are set to as a, a fluval 3.0 plant, just because I've fallen in love with them. I have a, a custom setting that I've built that uh, I call my day sim. And it specifically pushes a lot more red light later in the day. I'm basically trying to simulate sunset. Where we, when we look out, we see lots of reds and yellows and all those beautiful colors. I push those according colors to that part of my light cycle. Can I say definitively, scientifically, does it make a difference? Nope. Can, can I say from an experience of years and years of growing plants that I've seen a difference? Absolutely. I've been doing it in the morning. Okay. Should I try reversing it? So the one thing I would say is anything light-wise like that, like as opposed to uh, this person said do it at night or this person says do this, if you're trying it in your tank and you're having success a different way, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But if you're having problems... Try flipping it. See what happens. Your plants are going to tell you everything. Eventually, over time, you can tinker and play, and you'll, you'll find ways to just go, you know, I bet I could grow X faster, or I could get this to be slightly better color intensity, whatever the heck that may be. And you'll just play with your stuff, and you'll, you'll figure out, like, oh, just a little bit more light and fertilizer a little bit more like this, or slightly less food, and I... I'm not having as much algae issues. I'm feeding my fish too freaking much, whatever it may be. You find that perfect balance, that little triangle. You'll find it on your own. It's all about being willing to tinker and play with it. Any other questions? Okay, good. I've talked for way too long. Thank you so much for putting up with me.